The Secret Garden by Francis Hodgson Burnett. Chapter Twenty Two When the Sun Went Down. When his head was out of sight, Colin turned to Mary. Go and meet him, he said, and Mary flew across the grass to the door under the ivy. Dickon was watching him with sharp eyes. There were scarlet spots on his cheeks, and he looked amazing, but he showed no signs of falling. I can stand, he said, and his head was still held up, and he said it quite grandly. I told thee thou could as soon as thou stopped being afraid, answered Dickon, and thou stopped. Yes, I've stopped, said Colin. Then suddenly he remembered something Mary had said. Are you making magic? he asked sharply. Dickon's curly mouth spread in a cheerful grin. Thou's doin' magic thysel, he said. It's the same magic as makes these here work out o' the earth. And he touched with this thick boot a clump of crocuses in the grass. Colin looked down at them. Ay, he said slowly, there couldna be bigger magic than that there. There couldna be. He drew himself up straighter than ever. I'm going to walk to that tree, he said, pointing to one a few feet away from him. I'm going to be standing when Weatherstaff comes here. I can rest against the tree if I like. When I want to sit down, I will sit down, but not before. Bring a rug from the chair. He walked to the tree, and though Dickon held his arm, he was wonderfully steady. When he stood against the tree trunk, it was not too plain that he supported himself against it, and he still held himself so straight that he looked tall. When Ben Weatherstaff came through the door in the wall, he saw him standing there, and he heard Mary muttering something under her breath. What art saying? he asked rather testily, because he did not want his attention distracted from the long, thin, straight boy figure and proud face. But she did not tell him. What she was saying was this You can do it, you can do it, I told you you could, you can do it, you can do it, you can. She was saying it to Colin because she wanted to make magic and keep him on his feet, looking like that. She could not bear that he should give in before Ben Weatherstaff. He did not give in. She was uplifted by a sudden feeling that he looked quite beautiful, in spite of his thinness. He fixed his eyes on Ben Weatherstaff in his funny, imperious way. Look at me, he commanded. Look at me all over. Am I a hunchback? Have I got crooked legs? Ben Weatherstaff had not quite got over his emotion, but he had recovered a little, and answered almost in his usual way. Not there, he said, now to the sort. What's thou been doin' with thy cell, hidin' out o' sight and lettin' folk think thou was cripple and half witted? Half witted? said Colin angrily. Who thought that? Lots o' fools, said Ben. The world's full o' jackasses brayin', and they never bray nought but lies. What did thou shut thyself up for? Everyone thought I was going to die, said Colin shortly. I'm not. And he said it with such decision, Ben Weatherstaff looked him over, up and down, down and up. Thou die, he said with dry exultation. Now to the sort. Thou's got too much pluck in thee. When I see thee put thy legs on the ground in such a hurry, I knowed thou was all right. Sit thee down on the rug a bit, young mester, and give me thy orders. There was a queer mixture of crabbed tenderness and shrewd understanding in his manner. Mary had poured out speech as rapidly as she could as they had come down the long walk. The chief thing to be remembered, she had told him, was that Colin was getting well, getting well. The garden was doing it. No one must let him remember about having humps and dying. The Raja condescended to seat himself on a rug under the tree. What work do you do in the gardens, Weatherstaff? he inquired. Anything I'm told to do, answered old Ben. I'm kept on by favour, because she liked me. She? said Colin. Thy mother, answered Ben Weatherstaff. My mother, said Colin, and he looked about him quietly. This was her garden, wasn't it? Aye, it was that, and Ben Weatherstaff looked about him too. She were main fond of it. It is my garden now. I am fond of it. I shall come here every day, announced Colin. But it is to be a secret. My orders are that no one is to know that we come here. Dickon and my cousin have worked and made it come alive. I shall send for you sometimes to help, but you must come when no one can see you. Ben Weatherstaff's face twisted itself in a dry old smile. I've come here before when no one saw me, he said. What? exclaimed Colin. When? 
The last time I was here, rubbing his chin and looking around, was about two year ago. But no one has been in it for ten years, cried Colin. There was no door. I'm no one, said old Ben dryly, and I didn't come through the door. I come over the wall. The rheumatics held me back the last two year. That come and did a bit of prunin', cried Diggin. I couldn't make out how it had been done. She was so fond of it, she was, said Ben Weatherstaff slowly, and she was such a pretty young thing. She says to me once, Ben, says she, laughing, if ever I'm ill or if I go away, you must take care of my roses. When she did go away, the orders was no one was ever to come nigh. But I come, with grumpy obstinacy, over the wall I come, until the rheumatics stopped me, and I did a bit of work once a year. She'd gave her order first. It wouldn't have been as wick as it is if I hadn't done it, said Dickon. I did wonder. I'm glad you did it, Weatherstaff, said Colin. You'll know how to keep the secret. Aye, I'll know, sir, answered Ben. And it'll be easier for a man with rheumatics to come in at the door. On the grass near the tree, Mary had dropped her trowel. Colin stretched out his hand and took it up. A odd expression came into his face, and he began to scratch at the earth. His thin hand was weak enough, but presently, as they watched him, Mary with quite breathless interest, he drove the end of the trowel into the soil and turned Sam over. You can do it, you can do it, said Mary to herself. I tell you, you can. Dickens' round eyes were full of eager curiousness, but he said not a word. Ben Weatherstaff looked on with interested face. Colin persevered. After he had turned a few trowelfuls of soil, he spoke exultantly to Dickon in his best Yorkshire. Thou said as that have me walkin' about here same as other folk, and thou said that have me diggin'. I thought that was just leein' to please me. This is only the first day, and I've walked, and here I am diggin'. Ben Weatherstaff's mouth fell open again when he heard him, but he ended by chuckling. Eh, hey, he said, that sounds as if thou'd got wits in ow. Thou'rt a Yorkshire lad for sure, and thou'rt diggin' too. How'd thou like to plant a bit o' something? I can get thee a rose in a pot. Go and get it, said Colin, digging excitedly. Quick, quick! It was done quickly enough indeed. Ben Weatherstaff went his way, forgetting rheumatics. Dickon took his spade and dug the hole deeper and wider than a new digger with thin white hands could make it. Mary slipped out to run and bring back a watering can. When Dickon had deepened the hole, Colin went on turning the soft earth over and over. He looked up at the sky, flushed and glowing with the strangely new exercise, slight as it was. "'I want to do it before the sun goes quite, quite down,' he said. Mary thought that perhaps the sun held back a few minutes just on purpose. Ben Weatherstaff brought the rose in its pot from the greenhouse. He hobbled over the grass as fast as he could. He had begun to be excited, too. He knelt down by the hole and broke the pot from the mould. "'Here, lad,' he said, handing the plant to Colin. "'Set it in the earth thy cell, same as the king does when he goes to a new place.' The thin white hands shook a little, and Colin's flush grew deeper as he set the rose in the mould and held it, while old Ben made firm the earth. It was filled in and pressed down and made steady. Mary was leaning forward on her hands and knees. Soot had flown down and marched forward to see what was being done. Nut and Shell chattered about it from a cherry tree. "'It's planted,' said Colin at last, "'and the sun is only slipping over the edge. Help me up, Dickon. I want to be standing when it goes. That's part of the magic.' And Dickon helped him, and the magic, or whatever it was, so gave him strength that when the sun did slip over the edge and end the strange, lovely afternoon for them, there he actually stood, on his two feet— Laughing. End of chapter 22